And I'm going to go ahead and let everybody in. Uh oh, I guess I need to do a screen share for the background, huh? That'll work. So everybody know why we're here. All right. Can everybody see that okay? Yes. Yes. All right. Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you all for joining us for today's month of service presentation of the do's and don'ts of appearing in court when virtually or in person. My name is Nia Murray. I am the Programs Coordinator with Neighborhood Recovery Community Development Corporation, and we are one of the partners in the a month of service collaboration. Also included is the City of Houston's Department of Neighborhoods, and joining us today is Ms. Myra Hippolyte. Also, on behalf of our presenting partner with the Houston Bar Association, we have Mr. Stu Schmella. Did I pronounce it correctly? Okay, with the Lanza Law Firm, who's going to be uh, giving you all the presentation for today. Uh, but to give you a little bit of background about the uh, a month of service, uh, other partners included the Long Star Legal Aid, the Earl Carl Institute, um, Houston Volunteer Lawyers, Harris County. Um, Tax Assessor Collector's Office in the Harris Central Appraisal District. And together we make up a month of service. And basically a month of service is the collaboration of all eight organizations. We come together on a monthly basis and offer a variety of different workshops, provide information to the community resources uh, relative to asset building, asset protection, community empowerment, and the maintaining of generational wealth. And including in that our um, workshops, our legal workshops that are presented on uh, as part of our community uh, in, in community empowerment series to provide information to the community that necessarily don't know where to go for information, don't know where to start, don't know who to ask or what have you. So we know that there's a lot of information uh, that that don't get that doesn't get trickled down to a lot of underserved communities. So we wanted to make sure. That, uh, that we do our part and provide information as much as we can to the community so that uh, so that they are more informed and more aware and can make uh, more informed knowledgeable decisions about whatever it is that they are actually uh, facing. Um, information that is provided here today is for educational purposes only. It is not to be considered legal advice. However, we do encourage you to reach out to our legal service partners if you do find yourselves in need of any civil legal assistance. Um, a month of service has a, um, a pre-assessment referral uh, that we can make sure that you get information or that your uh, information is uh, distributed to the correct partner for you to apply with. Uh, don't automatically discount yourselves and automatically assume that you don't qualify for legal services because there are a variety of different uh, methods that you can use to, to get legal assistance if you find yourself in need. So um, I'll go over a little bit more information at the end as far as uh, other workshops that we've got that are coming up this week. Um, but also want to let you and everybody know that this is an opportunity to be as interactive as you'd like to be. Please feel free to ask whatever questions that you like. Uh, if you're more comfortable typing questions into the chat, please feel free to do so. Otherwise, you can unmute yourself at the end of the presentation and ask the question directly of the presenter. Uh, also keep in mind that we are um, uh, streaming live on our social media platform at Amos Houston TX, uh, as well as recording this session. So we wanna try to protect your privacy as much as we possibly can um, by just letting you know um, that we don't want any personal detail information kind of getting out there for everybody to have access to, uh, again, because it is being recorded as well as being uh, streamed live. So we don't want to, you know, don't want your information getting out there for everybody. So just do keep that in mind uh, and just ask that you try to keep your questions to be general and not real specific for your particular uh, situation. However, uh, we do encourage you to ask questions. If you are joining us on Facebook, please feel free to type your questions into the comment section and I'll make sure that I read those questions aloud at the end of the presentation as well too. So with that being said, we are going to move right on into our uh, presentation and introduction. So uh, Ms. Myra, would you like to introduce yourself first? Thanks, Ms. Nia. Welcome, Mr. Schmilla. My name is Myra Hippolyte. My last name's the same thing. My maiden name was Toledo or Toledo. So you can only imagine, holy Toledo was always being told to me. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Myra Hippolyte, and I work with the City of Houston Department of Neighborhoods on, under the direction of Division Manager Paul Green. 
On behalf of Mayor Sylvester Turner and Director Takasha Francis, we wanna welcome you to the Month of Service Partnership. This partnership is all about giving back free information to everyone, anyone that is watching this, anyone that's watching it while it's being recorded or on Facebook Live or on YouTube, welcome. Because this is all about you when you're going through a stressor in your life, know that you have a team of partners that's here to walk right by your side. Of course, we can't hold your hand. And that by that, I mean that it takes you to come and watch our virtual workshops, whether it be live, whether it be on Facebook, YouTube, or Instagram. Know that you have a team of partners that's standing by your side to get as much information for you that when you're going through a stressor, you can make whatever decisions you need to correctly. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day and great to see you guys back from a great holiday. Thank you. All right, Mr. Smello with the Londa Law Firm. You can go right ahead. All right, thank you, Nira, Nia. Thank you, Myra, and thank you all for being here today. Uh, before we get going into the, the substance, I just want to introduce myself a little bit. I'm Stu Schmella. I practice with the Lonza Law Firm here in Houston. We have a statewide practice, but I, I'm here in H-Town. My offices are in Upper Kirby. Uh, I practiced law since 2001. Uh, I went to college and law school here, uh, and I've lived in the greater Houston area since 1994. Most of my work involves civil, civil litigation in real people talk. That means people fighting over money, typically uh, because it's, uh, you know, someone alleges they've been hurt or, or something along those lines. And more often than not, I represent a company or an individual who's, be who's being sued uh, instead of someone suing. But I have done plaintiff's work and I've done a, a variety of things uh, throughout my 21 year career as a lawyer. Uh, I guess I'm close to 22 years now. But at any rate, uh, you know, let's talk about, you know, kind of some of the do's and don'ts with respect to court. But let me first, you know, really explain and explore some of the reasons why, why people who aren't lawyers might be going to court in the first place. Uh, we might have uh, someone who's a party in a civil matter. Again, maybe someone is suing or being sued by someone. Uh, we may have someone who has a traffic ticket, uh, whether it's city of Houston or a justice of the peace or something like that. And, and we may be called to, uh, go down there if we decide to contest it. We may have family matters where maybe it's a, a divorce or a custody issue or something like that. We may have a criminal matter where maybe it's us who's being, uh, prosecutor or loved one for whom we're testifying or, or we're a witness or complainant uh, for something that's happened to us. Uh, I mentioned the civil matter, you know, maybe a small claims court type case that are handled by the justices of the peace where someone has wronged us or, or someone believes we've somehow wronged them and they're suing for damages or something like that. Uh, there may be eviction proceedings where, where either someone is uh, claiming that we didn't pay rent or something like that, and they're trying to kick us out of our, our uh, place of residence, or maybe it's a place that we're renting to someone and they haven't paid us, and we're trying to recover possession. There are a lot of different ways uh, and reasons for us to go to court, but those are just some of the general ones I think that most people encounter on a, a regular basis. And my job today is to really visit with you all about some, <clears throat> some things that we can do to put our best foot forward in those situations, uh, to uh, give ourselves a chance of success. And uh, I don't have any secret sauce or anything like that. There's no trick per se or anything like that. But it's, it's my hope that some of these suggestions that I can give you all will help you be prepared and hopefully understand the process a little bit more. And I'm going to talk today about both doing it the old fashioned way in terms of being in person and, you know, going downtown to the courthouse on Caroline or Franklin uh, or, or, you know, some of the JP offices, that sort of thing. I'm also going to talk to you about some of the new rules for Zoom, because I'll tell you, just as Zoom has changed all sorts of businesses over the last three years or so following the pandemic, law is no different. 
And there are a lot of courts who now conduct hearings on a regular basis. And a lot of those types of hearings that I just mentioned, they conduct them by, by Zoom. And, and so some of the suggestions I'm gonna give you today will apply to Zoom uh, hearings and proceedings specifically. But let me start with some of the in-person concepts. And I, I think that most of the in-person concepts I'm going to discuss today relate to both in-person and Zoom. Uh, but I, I, let me start with those. I think the biggest tip that I can give someone is really try to have an understanding of why it is you're going to court in the first place. Is it that, that you're suing someone? Is it that you're a witness to something, maybe a car accident or crime, something along those lines? Are you asking the court to do something for you? Is it modify a custody agreement or something along those lines? It's really try to figure out what it is uh, that your role is. Because in a lot of ways, that will help determine uh, how much you need to do and what it is you may need to be doing. And so in order to figure out what your role is, I have a couple of suggestions. And, and again, I, I, I think they apply really to any uh, role that you might have, but it's just a couple of things that really help us from the get-go. One, you know, we'll, usually when we're asked to go to court, we receive some sort of legal document. Uh, it might be a sheriff knocking on our door at an ungodly hour and handing us a piece of paper. It might be something we receive in the mail, something along those lines. But typically, there is some sort of letter or correspondence, uh, a subpoena or something, directing us to attend uh, a specific court proceeding or hearing at a specific time and on a specific date. And so start with that, you know, read that. And it may be that, that there's a lot of legal mumbo jumbo in there. I get it. At least my, my suggestion is try to read that. Don't throw it away. Uh, keep a copy of it, whether, you know, you can keep a hard copy or you can maybe take a picture or scan it on your phone if you have that available, something. But make sure you don't lose it and make sure not only that you don't lose it, but you have it in a place that's <clears throat> easily accessible to you. Because the next thing I'm gonna suggest is really, you know, if you can, try to talk to a lawyer about it. And, and it you know, may be that, that the lawyer um, doesn't know all the ins and outs of the proceeding or anything like that, but a lawyer, he or she might be able to give you an idea particularly if you don't understand what the piece of paper says, what, you know, what it's asking you to do, why you're involved in this, it might help that a lawyer can at least begin to decipher it for you. At least tell you, hey, it looks like you're going to be a witness to this. Hey, it looks like, you know, for this lawsuit you filed, it looks like this is a date that the court's going to hold trial. Something like that. And, and so if you know a lawyer, great. Uh, if, if you need a lawyer, whether it's hiring one or whether it's using uh, a legal aid service, you know, something along those lines, uh, even, you know, for example, the HBA has uh, legal lines, I believe, I think it's still every Tuesday or Wednesday, I'm not sure, but if you go to the HBA's website, and it's hba.org, uh, there are lawyers who are essentially staffing uh, a telephone hotline that can answer general questions for you and they might be able to help you decipher what it is that this document is but i would really strongly suggest you know look at the paper that's requiring you to come to court and then talk to someone about it you know a lawyer doesn't necessarily have to be a lawyer if you know someone who maybe works at a law firm for example a paralegal or a legal secretary something along those lines uh, just ask someone to help you uh, understand. And um, yeah, Nia just indicated it's the HBA legal line is the name of the, the, the Houston Bar Association group that helps and their number is there in the chat. But all right, you know, we need to try to figure out what our role is in this because that'll in large part inform what it is that we may need to do. That goes into the next thing that I suggest that we do, which is prepare. 
you know, it, it's a it's a formal proceeding to be sure. And the, the last thing I think that any of us want to do is to look unprepared for uh, whatever it is we're going to be be doing in court. And believe me, I know that court in a lot of ways is foreign to us. Uh, it, it's not something that we do on a regular basis, at least not most folks. And, and so, you know, after we figure out what our role is and we can figure out, well, what it is that we need to do. If we're a witness, it might be just reflect on what happened, uh, you know, what the incident's about, or at least find out about it. If we're a party, whether it's, you know, we're, we're suing someone or being sued, you know, try to organize any materials we have, any pieces of paper, or other documents that might help us tell our side of the story. But it's take some time before then to be prepared. Uh, in addition to the, the, you know, whether it's organizing documents and that sort of thing, you know, go ahead and call the court. And, and, and they can't give you any legal advice, of course, but they can do things like tell you whether the hearing is still going on or not. And I can tell you from personal experience that oftentimes in civil matters, uh, folks reach some sort of settlement or something like that. And so we may subpoena a witness uh, to attend at a trial or, or something along those lines. We settle it a couple of days beforehand and gosh, the hearing's gone. And unfortunately, parties and staff aren't necessarily the best about letting people know that, hey, you don't need to go there. Uh, I'll give a quick example. Um, I have a client in Dallas who was subpoenaed to attend a trial, and uh, she she lives up in the Dallas area. And we were no longer involved in the case or anything like that. Uh, she was asked to appear there on a Monday morning. You know, as of Friday, uh, the Friday before, uh, the parties had said, yeah, she needs to attend and all that sort of thing. Well, they ended up resolving it over the weekend and they never called me and they never told her that, gosh, Monday morning, you don't need to show up to downtown Dallas to attend trial. That happens, but if you can be proactive and call the court and find out whether the hearing is going to go forward, that sort of thing, that can be a big help, certainly to, to prevent you from wasting your time and also in your preparation. Uh, it may be, too, that when you call the court, you can get information regarding directions. Uh, depending on the court, they may be able to give you some information regarding parking, that sort of thing. Uh, if there are convenient metro lines uh, where they might drop you off, that sort of thing, what stops you might want to look for. You know, help with some of the logistics and how much or how long the time, uh, how long the hearing might take place, how long you should expect to be there, those sorts of things. Uh, and so definitely I would say, uh, you know, call the court. That's part of the preparation process. If you are subpoenaed by a lawyer, for example, if I send you a subpoena or, or someone else sends you a subpoena to appear, call the lawyer. Ask him or her what's going on, why are you being asked to appear, uh, those sorts of things. They may not be able to tell you everything, and they may not be able to give you all, uh, you know, every question to be asked or anything like that, but certainly most lawyers will be able to tell you why it is that you are, are requested and required to come down to court that day. And so if a lawyer sends you a document or a subpoena, by all means, please call them up and figure out uh, what's going on. Uh, it may be, for example, if, if it's a subpoena for a trial or something like that, uh, you know, and particularly if you have some sort of significant health issue or transportation issue that prevents you from going there, you know, by all means, call the lawyer and, and tell him, gosh, I can't do this. I have a, a doctor appointment that I've been, you know, dealing with, uh, you know, had to schedule it six weeks out that sort of thing, I can't get away. Or maybe I've booked this trip to uh, Maui or something like that. Well, maybe not Maui now with the fires, unfortunately, but it's somewhere far away with non-refundable tickets. And you ask them, hey, can we reschedule that? You know, that's not only with the lawyer, that's potentially with the court as well, uh, where, where if you have some sort of meaningful, serious conflict that prevents you from going. And again, my the, the two typical ones that come to mind are uh, medical conflicts and travel that involves non-refundable tickets. I'll tell you this, 
ignoring it and not calling the court and, or not calling a lawyer and not telling him about these problems makes it so it's more difficult to deal with on the back end. And just taking a step back for just a moment, you know, the, the, the law, courts, all that sort of thing, people are the ones who make decisions. Whether it's a judge who he or she is very much a person, they, they have their own uh, preferences, they have their own um, uh, issues that they look for, their own pet peeves and all that sort of thing. But they're people. And uh, similarly, lawyers are people, believe it or not. I know it's sometimes hard to believe, but it's sort of, sort of thing where I think people by and large are willing to talk and work with other people with respect to legitimate concerns and legitimate conflicts and that sort of thing. And, and, and so with respect to dealing with people, we are not going to get any help if we don't tell them about certain issues that we may have that prevent, may prevent us from going to a hearing or something like that. And in my experience, most judges and most court staff, you know, they'll, they'll have their, um, you know, they have their own opinions and, and that sort of thing. And some may be more gruff than others, but by and large, they'll listen and, and, and they'll try to work with people to accommodate reasonable requests and that sort of thing. And so by all means, you know, reach out and communicate to the court, reach out and communicate to uh, other folks, uh, you know, lawyer who may be subpoenaing your appearance, that sort of thing. And so, a lot of what I'm going to be talking about, because we are dealing with people after all, deals with really making a first impression and a good impression on people and getting them to listen to us and respect us more than they otherwise might. Uh, a lot of this stuff isn't, isn't, you know, some, again, it's no secret sauce that lawyers have or anything like that. I think a lot of it makes common sense, but, you know, nonetheless, it can be a good reminder of these things. And so one thing that I would recommend that we do whenever we go to court for any purpose would be to really dress for success. Now, does that mean you need to wear a, a suit and tie like I'm wearing if you're a man or a, a pantsuit if you're a woman? No, I don't necessarily mean that. Although if you're a lawyer, obviously you do, do need to do that. I don't care if you don't practice uh, litigation all that often. But it, it means look respectable, presentable, all that sort of thing. I would say for most men and women, business casual would be appropriate. And one thing I would suggest too, call the courts and find out what their attire is. But generally speaking in Harris County in Houston anyway, uh, I would suggest that men at minimum wear either a polo shirt or you know, collar, a shirt with a collar. Uh, you know, it can be short sleeve or long sleeve. I think either one will work. Uh, it, you know, depending on, on um, circumstances, if you have a jacket available to wear, I think that'd be good. And then uh, I would suggest for both men and women, really try to stay away from jeans. It's really wear something that's more consistent with business casual. Uh, you know, so it might be slacks, khakis, those sorts of things. Uh, I, I uh, and again, business casual, I think would be the way I would describe it. And so for Men, you know, again, collared shirt, uh, pants, not jeans, certainly not shorts. Um, tennis shoes, maybe, but I'd probably suggest wear some sort of dress shoe or even a casual loafer or something like that. Similarly for women, uh, I'd, I'd recommend uh, some sort of blouse, uh, uh, you know, your choice as to whether it's pants or skirts uh, or dresses, that sort of thing, whatever you're more comfortable in, but certainly not uh, shorts and I'd avoid uh, jeans. You know, in a lot of ways, I'd suggest that, you know, think about what you would wear to a decent job interview and wear that. And, and so uh, I could tell you from firsthand experience, particularly some of the courts like a justice of the peace or that sort of thing. One, some of the, the judges will have a particular dress code. And two, if they see a person for better or for worse, who maybe is wearing a, a tank top or, you know, closely cropped shorts or, you know, something along those lines, if the judge lets you in the door in the first place, 
The second thing he or she might do after asking you to change or cover up will be quite honestly, they'll just tune you out. They're not going to listen to you as often as if you look more respectable, presentable, that sort of thing. And, and so, again, I don't think you need to wear formal wear or, you know, business suits or anything like that. But really, if you can, uh, try to wear something that, that business casual, uh, something along those lines. Uh, a couple of other suggestions with respect to attire. I don't think t-shirts work. Uh, and, and that'd be for both men and women. I, I would suggest really try to avoid t-shirts. If you need to wear a t-shirt uh, for whatever reason, you know, uh, by all means, try to have it to where it's a solid color and, and looks reasonably clean. Uh, don't have it to where it has a logo or anything like that. I say solid color, you know, if it has a, a decent pattern or, or something like that, something pretty, uh, pretty basic, I think would be fine. Uh, if you're wearing a t-shirt, again, my recommendation is don't, but, but really just look for something either solid or um, some sort of basic conservative pattern. Uh, please don't wear anything, uh, I, rather my suggestion is, please don't wear anything that has, you know, witty sayings on it or something like that. Uh, that's just, I, I think most judges are gonna more, be more apt to tune you out if that's the case. And by no means should you wear anything that's bold. Uh, you know, don't wear anything that has any swear words or, or anything like that or any, you know, vulgar slang for body parts or anything like that. There's a famous Supreme Court case, uh, Cohen versus California, that talks about someone who wore a, a jacket, I think, in a courthouse that said F the draft. And that's a very important case uh, for free speech rights, to be sure. But... I can tell you that although it's, you know, maybe protected by Supreme Court precedents in some ways that uh, Mr. Cohen, who was the one who uh, was, was uh, jailed in that case, uh, did not get the time of day from the judge when he wore his uh, jacket that said F the draft. And, and, and so we don't want to do that. We want judges and people at, in the courthouse to listen to us. We don't want them to, get, to give them any excuse to tune us out. And, you know, that brings up a good, uh, one good, good point or good issue to talk about, particularly in a lot of the places where we might en encounter uh, judges, uh, you know, the, the nuts and bolts stuff, you know, traffic ticket, uh, the JP doing traffic tickets or evictions, the uh, family district court judge who's handling divorces or something like that. A lot of these folks are uh, really under the gun with respect to their case volumes and, and their time. And they make snap judgments uh, all the time. And so it may be that for better or for worse, they make some sort of snap judgment based on their, based on a person's uh, attire and that sort of thing. And so we want to be on the right side of that if we can. And so by all means, the stress for success and avoid doing anything that might really frustrate or, or anger a judge. Um, along those lines, you know, judges, <clears throat> obviously most judges, particularly in Houston and Harris County, care about what people think about them because they're elected, right? They are our elected officials. But in a lot of ways, the judges are more concerned about the court as an institution about how people perceive the court, whether they're there or whether it's someone else long after them. And so they're trying to protect the institution uh, in a lot of ways. And one easier way for them to do it is to monitor and enforce dress and attire. And if they feel that we're not taking it seriously, if we're somehow being offensive by wearing a, a vulgar t-shirt or, or shorts that are inappropriate or something like that, They'll look at that, and again, they'll they'll focus on that in many times, in many instances, to the detriment of the other reasons why we may there, be there. Uh, and so we want to make sure that with our attire, we're giving them appropriate respect, or at least demonstrating appropriate respect, um, those sorts of things. And, and, and you know, I'll say this too. Um, 
if for some reason uh, you have problems making ends meet like that and getting the appropriate uh, attire, that sort of thing, again, my suggestion would be reach out to a friend or a bare minimum, tell the court, hey, I, I'm, I'm really in a bad way right now uh, I, and I'm having issues with this. Is there anywhere that you can help me uh, you know, direct me to you know, make sure that I can find something where I'm not offending the court or something like that. And chances are they'll tell you. Again, they're more likely to tell you and try to help you on the front end as opposed to on the back end when you show up and they're you're wearing something that uh, they just take offense to. And so again, I think attire is something that's important. Whenever it is that we attend our proceeding or our hearing, another thing I think is important is a pretty straightforward one. It's to be on time. We need to be on time. Again, judges, particularly in a lot of our courthouses here in Harris County and in other way, counties too, I mean, these, these tips aren't unique to Houston. They're busy and they're trying to move cases along. And they depend in many ways on the people who need to be there, whether it's a litigant, whether it's a lawyer, that sort of thing. They really need us to be on time. What happens if you're not on time might be a couple of things. One, the court might call it a hearing, uh, and if no one answers, well, gosh, they'll just put it either to the bottom of the stack, so to speak, with respect to proceedings for that day, or they may say, well, gosh, I, I called the hearing and no one appeared, so we're just going to either dismiss it or kick it down the line or something like that. It gives the court an easy opportunity to essentially avoid it and to um, move on to the next one. And, and, and so from our perspective, we don't want to be the cause of that. Uh, we just don't. It, it makes it very difficult. Uh, and so do what you can to please be on time. And if you're going downtown, for example, be sure to afford yourself more time than you need, than you think you need, because the security processes, at least at the Harris County District Courts, you know, the lines can be pretty lengthy. If you're going to the criminal courthouse on Franklin, that line, depending on when you go, can wrap around the block a couple of times. And, and, and so just please, and, and we've heard horror stories about criminal defendants who, you know, they tried to make it on time, they left their, their home early, that sort of thing, but nonetheless, they weren't on time. Some judges just don't care, and they may revoke someone's bail or something like that, uh, all because they weren't on time. So, you know, not only be on time, but please be early. Err on the side of being early, and if you have to sit there a while, well, you know, maybe bring a book or a magazine or something along those lines to help you pass the time. But please be on time. If we're not on time, then again, that's an easy way for the court to move on to the next one. And uh, additionally, it, it, it goes back to showing respect toward the court. Now, I will say that stuff happens sometimes, that we're in Houston, Lord knows we have so many traffic issues and all that, to where there can be backups. If you think you're running into an issue where you're running late, uh, have the court's number available and call them. It's not perfect, but if you call them and tell them in advance, my experience is court coordinators, clerks, and judges are far more accommodating, and they understand because they've been late, everyone's been late, uh, particularly going to a court proceeding. And so, Call them and let them know, gosh, I, I'm dealing with bad traffic on I-10 coming in from the loop. And uh, I, I, I thought I was going to be on time, but I'm running 10 minutes late. If you call them, they can deal with it. Uh, and so please, if you're running into that issue, by all means, contact the court, be proactive, reach out. And I don't know if they're going to cut you a break every time, but they're a lot more likely to cut you a break on the front end than, than them finding out on the back end. Uh, one other <clears throat> thing, and I talked about this uh, uh, a little bit, depending on what your role is in the case, uh, and this is more for when we're um, a party in a case, that is, we're a plaintiff or a defendant, maybe we're in small claims court or something like that. It's to really try to make sure that we have whatever evidence we need and have that ready to go, you know, and it might be 
uh, documents, pieces of paper, whether it's a lease or a copy of a check or you know, an invoice or something like that. If you can, please try to have not only a copy that you can keep, but a copy that you can give to the court and maybe even a copy that you can give to the other side. Uh, have that. Have not only those copies made, but those copies organized in a coherent manner to where people can understand and re readily review them. Similarly, if we have witnesses who we're needing to call for a small claims matter, that sort of thing, before you get there, please make sure, hey, you remember that we've got this deal going on Wednesday at three o'clock, right? And, and make sure that they know and are aware and that they can make it. Uh, those things, again, just from a basic advocacy point of view, I can tell you in times in my career, uh, the times when I'm organized and I look like I have my act together and all that sort of thing, those times go far more smoothly than the occasions when it looks like I'm, you know, fumbling with papers or that sort of thing, trying to find what it is that um, I, I, I want to show the court. And so by all means, please be organized, please be prepared. When we get there, when we're in the hearing and all that sort of thing, uh, a couple of basic suggestions. One that I tell every witness, every client that I have uh, when I prepare for a deposition or trial or anything like that. If you remember nothing else from what we talked about today, there's one simple rule. Tell the truth. Good, bad, or ugly. Tell the truth. Tell the truth. Lying to a court is punishable as perjury and it's a felony in Texas. And while most people don't get prosecuted for perjury, people who get caught up in trying to really stretch the truth or something like that, particularly on those occasions when uh, maybe the other side or the court can see through it, what happens is a person really loses credibility with the court or a jury, and we're not as apt to believe anything else that they say. And with respect to most of the issues that we deal with, the truth may sting, it may hurt, but nonetheless, um, if you tell the truth, it will almost always <coughs> go for you far more uh, effectively, far more favorably than if you don't. You know, just like whenever we were kids and I, I have uh, school age kids right now, they're in third grade. And I'll tell you, when do they get punished? Is it when they do the act that they shouldn't have done? No, it's when they try to lie about it to either uh, me or my wife. It's, you know, the cover up is worse than the crime, so to speak. And so uh, with all of it, just tell the truth, tell the truth. Again, judges are human. In a lot of ways, they can work with people who tell the truth. Uh, it may not be, you know, well, the answer they're looking for may not be the answer that we want to give, but almost always it goes so much more easily and so much better if we just tell the truth. And so, you know, that's really my, my most important tip of the day. Just tell the truth. Uh, when we're there, uh, you know, depending on the type of proceeding or hearing, you know, maybe the, the judge has questions for us. Uh, answer. You know, don't try to beat around the bush. Don't try to be evasive. Uh, most of the judges here in Harris County and really throughout Texas are all pretty smart. You know, they not only are college graduates, but they went to law school for three years and they worked hard at what they do and they interact with people uh, every day. And, and, you know, they're trying to discern whether people are telling them the truth or not. And so, uh, they can also tell if someone's being evasive, they usually figure out there's a reason why someone is trying to avoid answering the question in a straight way. And so if you can, really just answer the judge's question and, and, and go from there and let the chips fall where they may. And, and again, the answers may not be ones that we want to give, may not be the ones we want the judge to hear, but kind of like telling the truth, it goes so much better for us. The, chance, the times when I've seen it really go off the rails uh, in, in, in trials or proceedings when I've been in the gallery, something along those lines, that's when, for whatever reason, someone you know really wants to answer the question that they wish the court would have asked, or they try to duck it or that sort of thing. 
and it doesn't work. The judge is smart enough to know when someone isn't answering his question or her question. And so by all means, we need to just answer the judge's questions if we can. You know, one other thing uh, with respect to judges and them being human and all that sort of thing, and part of us putting forward our, our best impression, we need to be polite. Remember that in Texas, a judge under certain circumstances can um, at least temporarily jail someone for contempt of court, you know, either in a civil basis or a criminal basis. Now, most judges aren't going to do that, but, you know, they won't do that at all, of course, and we're more likely to get our point across in an effective way if we're polite. And that means being polite to the judge. And it might be, you know, showing appropriate deference and saying, yes, sir, no, ma'am, uh, addressing the judge as your honor or calling uh, the judge, you know, if you call them by their last name, call them judge so-and-so, something along those lines. It's showing the court and the institution the appropriate respect. Uh, similarly, with respect to interacting with staff, uh, staff in a lot of ways makes the engine of the court go, and they can make you or break you. Uh, I've certainly learned this as a lawyer, and so I, I really encourage you to, with the staff, whether it's a bailiff who's there, whether it's the clerk, whether it's a coordinator, that sort of thing, uh, treat them with respect and, and be polite to them. If you're not, they'll make your life hell. That, that's just a fact. Uh, they, in a lot of ways, control access to the court. They can help you with things. And it's just, a, again, it's a human tendency. Uh, folks are more willing to help people who are polite than people who are, who are not. And so that doesn't mean, you know, if, if we disagree with a judge, it doesn't mean that we have to back down in our disagreement or anything like that. But and it, it means that we need to be polite when we respectfully disagree with the judge. And, or, or the other side for that matter, if we're to contest it here. We just need to be polite. You will get far more with being kind to people in the, the civil court system or any court system than with being uh, impolite. Uh, impolite folks just, uh, it might work in a very short end, uh, short time frame, but it doesn't work long term. So by all means, please be polite to the judge, the staff, even the lawyers on the other side, if, if it's a contested matter. Again, if it's something where the lawyer is trying to jam us in some way, uh, and maybe we're asking them to cut us a break, there are no guarantees that they can do it. And oftentimes they can't, but they will be far more willing to at least inquire at their client, whether they can uh, do something uh, to help us in this situation, if we're polite to them, uh, instead of uh, being a jerk. It's just, it's, it's not, a, it's a recipe for disaster to be a jerk in this area. Uh, let's see. Uh, one other thing that happens, and it's different than if you and I are visiting and uh, you know, we may think we know something, but we're making an assumption or something like that. If we're in court and we're asked a question about something and we, honest to God, don't know the answer, say, I don't know. Say, I don't know, don't guess or speculate unless you're specifically asked to by the court. But, you know, we, we really just don't want to, we don't want to guess. And so if you don't know something, just tell the court you don't know. You know, I'm dealing with cases, for example, that, you know, it may be a car accident that happened in 2019, you know, almost four years ago now, right? And it's the sort of thing where my client, you know, has slept, slept since then. You know, we're dealing with a, a pandemic in between now and then. Uh, you know, a lot's going on. And it may be that, you know, this incident that happened a few years ago was not at top of mind uh, for him over the last few years. And so if you don't know, just say you don't know. Again, it may not be perfect, but it nonetheless can help you uh, maintain that credibility with the court, with the, uh, you know, if we're at a proceeding and we're dealing with a jury, uh, have you know, people understand that people don't know everything all the time or they don't remember. So say that, say that. I find that it really helps. The other thing I'd say is, and this can be hard, uh, but it's really 
you know, we need to try to be ourselves, be authentic. Uh, I like to tell a story about, uh, I had a case uh, arising out of Hurricane um, Katrina, actually, in New Orleans. And I tried a case in 2010 in New Orleans. And so this is 13 years ago. And one of the, the star witnesses for our side of the case was a fellow who's pretty rough around the edges. Uh, he, uh, you know, blue collar guy, uh, you know, have a biting tongue and all that sort of thing. And we realized that, that obviously we needed him to show respect to the court and the other side and all that sort of thing. But in trying to, we, did, we couldn't change who he was. We needed him to be authentically himself. And so you need to be yourself. That doesn't mean be rude if you happen to be a, a rude or rough person or anything like that. But otherwise, you know, in terms of what you feel and what you believe and all that sort of thing, be authentic, be yourself. Uh, if you're not those things, people see through it pretty quickly. And so by all means, uh, you know, be authentic. And so in that case, for example, the New Orleans case, he was a guy where, you know, um, he's a blue collar guy, rough around the edges. Putting him in a suit would have been a disaster. And trying to, you know, uh, coach him up to, to use lawyer language and all that sort of thing would have been a disaster. We needed him to be himself to uh, you know, be able to communicate. And the jury, I think, really believed him in that case. And he, he was far more effective being himself than trying to be someone who he wasn't. And so we were okay with him being a little rough around the edges. We just tried to smooth him out. Let me talk now about some of the specifics with respect to Zoom. Uh, again, Zoom is something that we're all coming to terms with and, and you know, lawyers to be sure. Uh, I know lawyers know it, but maybe maybe you all don't if you're not lawyers. You know, there was a story about an attorney in West Texas who I think their daughter or, or, or son, I don't know, but their kid or nephew or niece or something like that was, uh, attending Zoom, uh, some sort of proceeding on Zoom and uh, they couldn't change a cat filter for, uh, or, you know, from the hearing or from whenever their child had, you know, had a Zoom interaction, something like that. They couldn't figure out how to change it uh, before the hearing. And so, you know, <laughs> the, the poor lawyer, you know, when his screen would come on, uh, you'd see a cat. And the poor lawyer was reduced to telling the judge, I am not a cat. And so those things didn't happen five years ago. Uh, but Zoom is here. It's here to stay. There are a lot of courts now uh, throughout the state who will allow witnesses to attend via Zoom, who will allow people to testify via Zoom. It's really great in a lot of ways. So there are th some things that we can do to really help ourselves. One, uh, for ourselves, just make sure that we have whatever the proper equipment is to access it. And I realize I'm talking to an audience that is able to access Zoom today, so maybe um, y'all are ahead of the game on this. But make sure, you know, is it a phone, uh, is it a laptop or another computer, that sort of thing, where you have working microphone, working camera, and working speakers or headphones or earbuds that you can use. I will say that to the extent you can either upgrade or use something a little bit different than a phone, I'd recommend that. Uh, I, I can tell you that for my clients, for example, a lot of whom are, you know, salt of the earth, truck drivers, that sort of thing. You know, oftentimes they may not have the latest, greatest uh, laptop for them to use or something like that. Uh, I, I quite honestly bring them into a lawyer's office and I'll sit them down with a laptop with a, you know, good microphone, good speakers, uh, and uh, a good camera. Uh, I don't think you have to go out and, and invest in these things if you're not using Zoom or Microsoft Teams regularly by any stretch, but just make sure it works. And, you know, if you're represented by counsel, talk to him or her about, you know, maybe some things that you can do and, you know, maybe it's come into their office or something like that. And, uh, you know, if you have a friend who maybe she or he has a pretty good computer set up, uh, that sort of thing, maybe they've talked about being on Zoom, uh, you know, as a way to communicate with their family or that sort of thing. 
talk to them and figure out if, 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 if you're feeling unsure about yourself, uh, figure out if that's a solution that maybe you can use. Uh, and, and, and again, I think don't, don't be afraid to ask. You know, and, and maybe it's, if you don't have it, again, whether it's ask a friend, if you have a lawyer, by all means, just reach out to someone. Uh, another suggestion I would have would be check your location and make sure that you're in a place that's relatively quiet and, and where you won't be disturbed for a period of time. Uh, you know, for example, here, I have an office. I have a door. I can write, do not disturb on it. And people will know and understand, hey, now's not the time to go barge into students. Uh, and ask them a question on something else. Uh, try to find somewhere, and it doesn't have to be, you know, particularly, you know, it doesn't have to be ornate or anything like that. But just somewhere where you can be quiet for however long the hearing is uh, for that period of time. Uh, you can typically, you know, it, it may be, and this comes up in depositions a lot, can you have someone in the room? You know, I'd say try not to have someone in the room with you unless he or she is, is real necessary to the process. If you have someone, please let everyone know, hey, I've got my niece here. She's helping me with the computer stuff because for whatever reason, I can't do it uh, or, or something along those lines. So be fully disclosed on who it is you have there and, and why they're there. Uh, but fundamentally, it's we want to make sure we're in a place that's relatively free from distraction. You know, another consideration has to do with backgrounds. I'm not necessarily doing a great job of it today, but, you know, understand that y'all are seeing my head, my chair, and then, you know, you're seeing the degrees I have in the wall. I think they're in reverse, but uh, make sure that whatever you have in the background uh, is something that you're comfortable with. And of course, Zoom has plenty of filters to where if you want to do a, uh, you know, green screen with, you know, a picture of the Golden Gate Bridge on it or something like that in the background, that can work well as well. Uh, I would just say, you know, keep it tasteful and keep it fairly simple. And, and uh, we don't want the background to become a distraction to what it is that we're saying or doing while we're on screen. Uh, depending on the court, if we're doing it via Zoom, we may have to wait for a long time. Uh, I know that there are certain counties where, you know, it might be that you're, you're essentially in a waiting room for 45 minutes to an hour. Well, that's the case, just be patient. You know, it may be that you, you know, go up and get a drink or something like that, but you know, make sure that you're still logged in, that you haven't uh, uh, logged out, that you can continue to monitor it. That way when the court pulls you in and it's your time to shine, you're not, uh, you know, down the hall or that sort of thing. And so uh, just make sure you can monitor it and all that. And one other thing, you know, again, finding that out, uh, a great, it's a great excuse to call the court. Uh, a lot of courts have instructions with respect to Zoom on their websites. Uh, oftentimes, though, it's call the clerk and figure out uh, what it is that the court does with respect to Zoom. Will they send out a hearing link for each hearing? Or is it a main room where it would be there for all sorts of other hearings and all that? When you're in, a hearing or proceeding, and particularly when it's A, not your turn to speak, or B, and or B, when it's another proceeding, for example, another hearing or something like that, I would encourage you all to really try to mute your screens, uh, mute your, your sound rather, and maybe even uh, turn your screen to uh, no picture or graphic or something like that. Uh, the thought is there can be a lot of dead time, particularly if we're watching hearings or proceedings that aren't really involving us and that aren't interesting to us, that happens, that's life. Um, and, and we don't want the court, we don't want anyone catching a straight comment, a straight eye roll, something like that. And so you know, we wanna make, we, we don't wanna disturb the court or disrupt the court at all. So I'd really encourage folks to say, hey, you know, mute your microphone, uh, obscure your screen, that sort of thing. So people don't know uh, that you're rolling your eyes when you see something that's crazy. Uh, another thing with having a distraction-free area, going back to that, uh, if um, you know you have someone who's typically home at that time, for example, you know, my, my wife oftentimes uh, works from home or will be home in the afternoon or something like that, uh, just before she goes and picks up the kids. Uh, and if I'm working at home, and I have a Zoom hearing or something like that. I'll try to let her know. 
That way she knows, hey, this is this is a space where, uh, unless she wants to be on camera, that, that she uh, probably needs to avoid for the next little bit. And so let your let your people know that you've got a Zoom hearing and ask them not to disturb you. Uh, one issue oftentimes with Zoom, and, and this is for lawyers and individuals, has to do with documents, you know, pieces of paper if we're asked about something. If you think there's a chance that the court's going to ask you about a particular you know, piece of paper, maybe they really want to see your copy of the contract or something along those lines, uh, try to figure out if there's a way we can scan it and potentially upload it uh, so that the court can can share it uh, and, and review it and all that stuff. And you know they may have special procedures that we need to follow before, but nonetheless, I, I'd really you know ha have your documents organized. Uh, I can tell you one thing that I do before depositions. I was going to take one on Zoom this morning. Is I had all the documents ready to go, and and you know I was you know ask the court reporter, would you like me to email them to you? Would you like me to upload them in the chat? Whatever works. But, but, you know, it's kind of thinking about that type of stuff beforehand. And again, I, I would implore you all really with Zoom or with any of this, uh, if you can, uh, at least on a general basis, um, you know, by all means, please ask a lawyer if he or she can give you some tips uh, on, on how to put your best foot forward. Um, so I've got 159 on my... Um, uh, clock. Uh, I, I don't know how long I was supposed to speak today, but thank you all so much for giving me time. And I'm happy to stay for quite a while and, and answer questions that anyone has. Uh, and, and, you know, by all means, it's been a real treat. And uh, I'm tired of letting my, uh, of hearing myself talk. And so if y'all have questions, by all means, fire away. Thank you. You know, um, if anyone would like to unmute themselves and um, ask the questions, please raise your hand real quick so that we can go ahead and, and open it up for you to ask questions. Um, but in the process that you're doing that, you know, I, I thought it was amazing that you did remind everyone what to wear and what not to wear. Because a lot of times when you're going, you know, and, and you think, hey, it's not, I'm just going to, to uh, traffic court. Even then, you know, you have to be mindful of what to wear. And what Because when you go to court, you see a lot of people you know, they have to remind them, turn off your phones, you know, don't talk, uh, make sure, you know, you're, you're dressed properly. Some, sometimes they're telling them they have to go home and change, you know. And, and, and Myra, along those lines, I can give you a specific story in that. I was, I think I was getting documents from, from uh, one of the, the, the office where uh, Gary Ridgway used to be over on Chimney Rock. He's a former justice of the peace. Uh, I think it was like Chimney Rock and um, Gulfton, some, somewhere around there. And uh, I saw a young lady there who was wearing a tank top and she was wearing shorts that were way too short for anyone to wear and, and all that sort of thing. And the clerk told her essentially, you need to leave now and change. You know, it didn't matter whatever the justice was or her cause or anything like that. It didn't matter. The court wasn't going to hear it because the staff was going to help the court enforce the uh the the dress code of the board because they saw it as a basic respect issue and so we don't want to be that guy or gal it's embarrassing you know let's be blunt about that we, no one likes to be embarrassed and that's an easy way for us uh, to to avoid being embarrassed and so by all means you know really dress for success i didn't talk about phones but you know that that's definitely a big one if you have it turn it off uh mm -hmm. when you're in in a courthouse, uh, it just makes it so much smoother. Uh, and and um, that's a pet peeve, you know, and if it happens a couple of times, uh, you know, the court's gonna confiscate it until the hearing's over. And, and that's, again, it more more than the, the inconvenience of it, quite honestly, depending on, you know, how many people are in the courtroom and all that sort of thing, when you have a judge pointing at you, identifying you as a bad actor and, and all that, it makes us feel like dirt. Mm -hmm. honestly and no one wants to go through that you know it's just I, and you know i i go to uh, saint cecilia catholic church uh, for mass on sundays and the father has been pretty good father francis about not you know pointing and and you know heckling someone or anything like that if you hear 
uh, a phone ringing during mass at 10 o'clock on Sunday, but everyone in the church knows and was, and <laughs> we just don't want to be in that position. And, and you know, it's, it's so funny because I talk loud. That's just my natural way of talking. And, but I do always remember when I'm going, if I get a ticket, and I'm going to traffic court, Myra, lower your voice because you will be called. I will be called out because I talk loud. And that's one of the things that I, you know, you're saying, well, be yourself. But I myself know, you know, lower your voice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's definitely be yourself. Be yourself within reason, though, right? And understand that there are things we have to do that really with, with the, the little things that we're talking about, it all goes back to respect the process and, and, and whether it's attire, whether it's, uh, you know, talking out of turn or that sort of thing, telling the truth is exactly the same thing. What happens is if a judge believes that a person isn't telling the truth, the judge probably thinks that that person thinks a judge is stupid. Okay. That's going to tick off a judge to no end. It shows a basic lack of respect. And so it's just, it's not worth it. It's never worth it. And, and you know, one thing that um, an attorney has had all, also told me that if you get asked a question, just answer the question. Don't blabber. You know, like you were saying, okay. just don't go above and beyond and give so much information. Just answer directly the question that was asked. And that's it. Because a lot of us, when we get nervous, we got, we get to talking and we get just open start, telling on, start telling on yourself. <laughs> <laughs> well, we want to explain it all and get it all out. And, and it may help us in a lot of ways, but, you know, for the person who is asking the questions, maybe it's a judge more often than not, it doesn't necessarily help her decision process. You know, maybe she wants to know just one particular fact. And if we answer that, maybe that satisfies her. Now, oftentimes we can ask for an opportunity to say something, uh, at the end of the questions, that sort of thing, uh, and, and give the opportunity to, to say whatever it is that we haven't told the court. And I would encourage us to do that. But really, I think it's a good point, too. It's, it's answer the question, answer only the questions asked. Don't give them anything for free. Yeah, because Myra is known for talking. <laughs> and I'm just talking about Myra, me. I, remember, I'm not talking about anyone. So I'm just talking about specific Understood. Understood. myself. And I was just looking if where does does the court typically assist with like if somebody is having a hard time financially or what have you, they don't have, you know, clothes to actually appear in court. Do they where do they go or do they send people to some particular place or? You know, I don't have a good answer for that, Mia, in terms of I don't know if it's a particular place. Uh, I, I will tell you that a lot of our judges are fairly sensitive to those sorts of concerns now. They won't necessarily you know, have a, a long list or anything like that, but my experience is they'll try to work with people, you know, and, and maybe suggest, hey, you know, do that. And, and, and fundamentally, again, if they know that maybe, you know, we're, we're down on our luck for whatever reason, and, and, you know, if they know that on the front end, then they'll be a lot more understanding, I, I think. Uh, and, you know, particularly in something like, um, I don't know, an eviction proceeding or, or something like that. And then, you know, they know that oftentimes in dealing with those, the people are going in a bad, they're because they're in a bad way, right? And, and I, I'm not saying that the judge is going to have a magic answer to anything, but my experience is they're human. And if people just reach out, they're oftentimes willing to help. Mm -hmm. And we'll not get any sort of assistance if we don't reach out. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, and a lot of times the attorneys help them also. Um, you know, help them find clothes, specifically if, if you're homeless or if you're in a bad situation, your attorney, if you, you work with your attorney and let them know what you're going through, nine times out of 10, your attorney is, is, is going to figure out something uh, to assist you in that process. Yeah, absolutely. And if you're, if you're being helped by an attorney, really lean on him or her to help you navigate the process with everything, with its you know, what can you expect, of course, from a substance perspective, you know, how long can you expect, but, you know, things like, hey, when do I need to be there? What do I need to wear? And if you're having, if you're having issues, let them know, and, and they can help uh, identify potential solutions or potential places to turn. Okay. I was trying to look up on, um, 
there's a, an organization called Career Gear, but I know that they only they they mostly help yeah. clothe people for jobs and interviews and stuff like that. I don't we, know about we, before. We've got we've been called from attorneys and we've assisted uh, some, specifically the homeless, uh, you know, and so search has also assisted a lot of the homeless, you know, in that process also. So there's different organizations that assist not only the homeless, but people that are going through a hard time. And, you know, uh, most attorneys reach out and, and, and try to assist their, their uh, clients. Have you, have you found sometimes that people just won't show up for court sometimes because that is an issue? They just won't say anything. So like they'll say, oh, I didn't have anything to wear. So they just don't show up. I, I can't tell you any specific instances, but I have no doubt, Nia, that it's happened. No doubt at all. That, that you know, maybe for, for whatever reason, someone's just flat embarrassed uh, or, yeah. or something along those lines. I mean, it, it, people are human and, and I get that. Uh, I have no doubt that it happens. I, I don't know how, how frequently it happens or anything like that. And, and look, I would also counsel anyone who says the choice between going maybe even in, in rags versus not going at all going rags right absolutely going rags because then if you don't go then the courts are just going to assume that the person's blowing it off and it just gets worse and so again people are people are human and, and people can understand judges can understand look if someone's just flat can't afford it if they're you know if they've caught a tough break all those sorts of things going and and explaining those issues is far better than not going at all no question about and also, they can call two one one if anyone's going through a dire situation in their life and they need any type of assistance. They can call two one one, and I am pretty sure you'll get assistance there also. Yeah. Do you um, do you notice a difference, or do every does everything that you actually say apply to uh, the youth also when they're showing up for, for court, the juveniles? Because I've seen quite a few of them show up for court. My advice, my advice to you applies if you're eight or 80, quite honestly. Uh, and, 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 and yeah, it's, it's really, you know, particularly with young people, I think, you know, most judges are, are going to be in their 40s, 50s, 60s, that sort of thing. They're already going to be dealing with an age gap anyway, right? Mm -hmm. and, and worried about, you know, snotty youth and all that sort of thing. They, kids don't need, to, don't need to confirm the judge's suspicions. <laughs> but no, it, it absolutely applies to young people just as well. And I can tell you uh, an old story from when I was in high school, uh, a little bit different, but uh, so I uh, I got my first uh, moving violation or I didn't have a, a proof of insurance, a valid proof of insurance. And this is back before you could show it on your phone and all that sort of thing. I didn't have the card in my glove box. Uh, we had insurance. It just didn't have the current one. And uh uh, you know, officer wrote me a ticket and I had to drive, you know, two hours to my home to go uh, talk to the court and get dismissed and that sort of thing. And there was a, uh, you know, it was a small claims court in Upper Kittitas County, Washington. Uh, I grew up in, in the Seattle area. And there was another kid in there who had been fined and I think had, he had pled guilty to minor possession. He had been at a keg party, you know, high school graduation. He was 18, drinking age was 21, all that sort of thing. And, you know, it happens, not the end of the world. It wasn't going to wreck his life or anything like that. The young man, uh, when he wrote the check out for the fine, you know, call it 150 bucks, something like that. In the memo to the check, wrote F you. Oh. And, you know, he didn't, he didn't clean it up the way I just did. He wrote F you. And the judge dragged him back to a upper Kittitas County, Cleola, and read him the riot act. And, and, and you could tell that the kid thought he was being funny. And when the judge blurted it out, I'll tell you, the, the courtroom died laughing. But then we saw the wrath of the older judge. He was, you know, kind of a stereotypical country judge in a lot of ways. And he was just, he was offended. And, and he was going to make an example out of this young man who I think, you know, by other accounts, he was fine. He was going to college and all that sort of thing. But he was doing things like he was going to write the dean of his college and, and, and tell him about what had happened and all that sort of thing it wasn't going to affect them in the grand scheme of things i think right. but you know, it, it was a sort of thing where the young man made a a childish error in judgment and the judge punished him for it and 
So yeah, it's all these things apply to kids with equal force, if not more, quite honestly, than adults. Yeah. Okay. And I agree. I I, I think a lot of times when we are we as parents, because I am a I love my children and they're grown now, but when they did receive a, cita a citation, you know, we went through, hey, you say this, you do this, you make sure you dress this, don't do that. You know, there's a process. And even just like we had um, a couple of weeks ago, when you get stopped, what do you do? What do you don't do? You know, we went through the right act of, of, you know, keep your hands up, don't move. It's the same thing when you go to court, there's a process and we as parents have to remind our children that you know there is a process and it's a process of respect. And even though you feel like you are respecting them, you still need to walk with that process always in your mind uh, when you're dealing you know, with, with the court system. One way or another, you still have to walk with respect one way or the other. Absolutely, Myra. And you know, one thing I'd add to that too would be um, judges are a lot more inclined to cut a young person a break, right? Mm -hmm. Because we've all made mistakes, we're all we're all not perfect, right? And, and they're willing to, you know, whether it's reduce a fine or toss a charge or something like that, they're they're more willing to do it in a lot of ways than they would with someone like me. I'm, I mean, I'm 47; I should know better by now, right? But all that goes out the window when we, for a young person, if he or she doesn't show the court respect. That's just that's that's. Just a basic, almost immutable law. I think. I mean, independent of any, you know, law in the statute books. It's just every every person, you know, demands that young people respect them. They're willing to cut them a break, and if not, they're dead. And so, when you're when you're young, just remember: if you're a young person watching this, or if you're a parent watching this, make sure you go through that process of reminding your child, you know, hey, dress properly, talk properly, and always carry yourself with respect to the, um, the judge, police officers, or whoever. There is a process and make sure you act accordingly as well as they should act accordingly. And I'm sure it's a mutual process and uh, just make sure you remind everyone, especially your children when they're going to court. Cause I went to, uh, my kids got citations and you know, my husband and I were taking turns at one time <laughs> going to court for tickets but we were there with them but we were always reminding them this is the process and this is what you have to do um and always be respectful so just make sure you take that time and remind them the process and what do not turn on your phones don't talk loud like miss myra hippolyte you know lower your voice dress appropriately and always say yes ma'am no sir and just respect okay all right, I don't have any questions in the chat here. And I was looking back at the registration to see if I had any, and I don't see any online on Facebook. So, Mr. Schmella, I think you covered quite a bit of information here already. Wonderful. So, thank you very much. We really appreciate you taking the time out this afternoon to provide this information uh, to our participants and to the community uh, that are all watching. Um, you know, a lot of folks just don't know you know if you don't know you don't know so uh, thank you very much for, for for giving this information out today uh, my, my pleasure nia and myra thank you all so much and one thing i'm going to do i'm going to leave my email in chat if okay. for whatever reason uh folks here uh have a particular question that that you know for whatever reason they didn't want to address here or, you know i know sometimes i'll be thinking about you know attending something and i'll, I'll pick my question an hour later shoot me an email yeah. You know, I, I, and, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll try to respond to the best I can. I, you know, I'm not going to necessarily give you any legal advice. I can't advise you about your specific problem, but if you have a question about appearing in court, uh, that sort of thing, by all means, I'll, I'll try to help you with it. Okay. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, so what's so this? Thank you all for the helpful, valuable information. Uh, and I'll make sure to include your, uh, your email as well on the link with the recording. Um, can you say it out loud also for the folks that are joining on Facebook? They can't see the chat. Yeah, sure. So my uh, my email address is my first initial and my last name. So it's S Schmella, S S C H M as in Mary, E L L A as in Apple, at Lanza, L A N Z A, lawfirm.com. I know that's a mouthful. 
You can also look up Stu Schmella uh, and, and you'll get to my firm's website and all that sort of thing. But uh, yeah, by all means, thank you all so much for the opportunity and uh, I wish you all continued success and gosh, it's hot out there, y'all. Try to say, yes, cool. oh okay. my goodness. Yes, it is. <laughs> check on your neighbors, check on your loved ones. Just kind of remind everybody of that. I was so looking forward to the rain yesterday and it got cloudy and it passed right over. <laughs> oh, no. It, 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 oh, it, it, no. Not even a drip, not a drop, not nothing over here. So I, I was so thoroughly disappointed. Hey, Mia, let me, let me add something real quick, talking about the heat. My husband and I ride motorcycles. I have a three-wheeler and he has his Harley, which he calls mine a tricycle. But if you see motorcycles and there's a, a, a traffic accident and there's motorcycles next to you, give them water. Uh, be a partner, be dear, because we were in, uh, there was a five car pileup on 45 North coming from Galveston last weekend. And we were stuck in traffic for 30 minutes in that heat, but we were very thankful. We don't know who you were, but we are thankful for those little angels that kept giving us water. So when you have time and you see a motorcycle and it's an accident, take the time to give back and give them some water. This is just my little reminder. <laughs> All right, be, be nice, everybody. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Thank you for all of our participants. Uh, we got coming up tomorrow. We have our money, health and wealth, our living benefits and insurance um, presentation that's scheduled for tomorrow at 4 p.m. As well as on Thursday is our legal advanced planning and why you need it. Um, that's at on Thursday at 1 p.m. And then um, next week. Uh, I guess kind of like a, the continuation from this is how to navigate the, the Harris County court system. So if you have questions about the, you know, how the court system actually works and, and things of that nature, then you might want to come back and actually join us for a little bit more in-depth detail about that for next week. So uh, that'll be next Tuesday at, at, um, at 1 p.m. on September the 12th. So thank you all very much. We appreciate you uh, all joining us. Thank you all for joining us on Facebook as well. Uh, hope you all have a wonderful remainder of your afternoon. Take care of yourselves and you all stay safe. We'll see you next time. Y'all take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.